Okay, so you need to be familiar with the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, UV typically quoted in wavelengths, nanometers. What do we quote with IR? We say a peak is at 2200. What is that unit? Inverse. First off, what do we call that number? Wave number. And a wave number is reciprocal centimeters. Okay? So it's in, it's in centimeters, which is a length, a wavelength, but it's reciprocal. Right? This is also wavelength, but we don't do anything like reciprocal. So it's just given in, that's, we talk wavelengths here, not wave numbers. Okay? Um, all right, let's move on from here. Um, here's an example UV disc spectrum of butadiene. Okay, compared to IR, we're going to find that it's much, much more simpler in terms of number of peaks. And also, it's sort of the other way. There are baselines at the top, and we get peaks that come down, right? Here's the baselines at the bottom, and we get peaks that go up. Okay? And up over here is absorbance. <coughs> what are we absorbing? We're absorbing different wavelengths here on the x-axis. And we said the standard wavelengths before, 2 to 400 for UV. It's 2 to 300. The problem is this compound doesn't absorb anything out here, so it's just not shown. The main absorbance is right here, you see, the main absorbance. This is some arbitrary numbers. It can be just percentages. You know, 100% would be like 1.0. Uh, it absorbs, um, it's just a relative scale, okay? Um, so typically to, to do the procedure or experiment, um, you know how the IR, you just put a little compound up there, okay? Typically UV, you do tend to use a solvent, dissolve the compound in the solvent. And then it, you got a little cell that holds your little solution, and it goes into the instrument. And then, then it's pretty much a similar set, setup. But we're looking at the compound that's in there, and then we pass the, the ultraviolet or the visible, and we see how much is absorbed, and that can be plotted. Uh, this compound, butadiene, absorbs a lot in the 200 to 240 range here, yeah? And that's ultraviolet. So the visible doesn't start to win. <coughs> 4 to 800, right? Apparently it's not absorbing in the visible or it would be plotted here. Okay? Now, what's the main, what's the wavelength of maximum absorbance? Well, right here. And that comes down to about right here. You see? That's the maximum absorbance is right there. And that's what? About, what is that? About, um, Two what? Seventeen. About two seventeen. Yeah, that looks like about like two seventeen. So that's the point of maximum absorbance. Okay, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> we call that the lambda max. Lambda meaning wavelength. That's the wavelength where you get the maximum absorbance. <clears throat> two seventeen nanometers, which is in the UV range. That can become a physical constant for the compound. Just like a refractive index or a uh, rotation if it's chiral. These are all physical standards where this compound is it, going to always be the right melting point. Although you can get a little variation in some of these. Okay. This compound doesn't absorb in the visible. Butadiene. Pretty simple, yeah? Uh, let's see what's next. Okay, question. What leads to the absorbance? Why is it absorbed the UV light? Well, what about IR? Why does the compound absorb IR light? What, what, what's the 
Explanation. Okay, here is a bond just sitting there minding its business, you yeah, know, operating. We know bond lengths are not just fixed, they, it's an average. Okay. And then somebody throw me some IR. <laughs> I just absorbed it. <coughs> I took on the energy. How do I? Now I've got a higher energy vibration. There's lots of physics that go into the absorbing that light, but the energy is seen. We go from a lower energy vibration, well, this is a stretch, there could be other types of vibration, to a higher energy. How did it go to a higher energy vibration to absorb the IR? Well, we can plot that absorbance. Now, IR has different wavelengths. I'm not sure what wavelength exactly you threw at me, something that corresponds to maybe 2200 in the spectrum. Yeah, about okay. <laughs> and I did it. Okay. Same bond. Throw me something that corresponds to 3000 in the spectrum. Yeah. Okay. You see, I just ignore you. <laughs> this bond only is going to absorb at a wavelength that corresponds to 2200. Sounds like maybe I'm a triple bond, right? We know they only absorb at about 20. They ignore all the other wavelengths. Okay? Turns out that this frequency, that frequency that you threw at me needs to match this frequency for that physics to take place and the absorption to take place. Okay, so what's going on with the UV vids? How, do, how does a molecule absorb that? Well, it ain't this. It's not a, it's not a vibration that absorbs the energy. Here, it's electron excitation. We excite electrons. Okay? And a lot of times, UV vids is called a known name. It's called the elect electronic spectrum. What type of electrons can we excite? <coughs> Any in the molecule? What type of different electrons are in molecules? First off, you have bonding electrons versus non-bonding. And non-bonding electrons we typically call what? Lone pairs. So you got lone pairs and bonding pairs. That's two different types. Lone pair is a lone pair, although it can be in a different type of orbit. Bonding pairs, though, we can have different types of bonds. We can have sigma bonds and pi bonds. And so we can differentiate between electrons that are in sigma bonds and pi bonds. Uh, and all of these types of electrons can be excited to a higher energy <coughs> orbital. And that's what this is showing. Uh, the lowest energy orbitals are going to be sigma bonds. They're your strongest bonds. Pi bonds are not going to be quite as stable or lower in energy, but they are still bonds. Your highest energy electrons are going to be the lone pairs, because they're not bonding. Bonding is a good thing. They're not, getting, they're not doing the good thing, so they're not, this, they're not as lower as energy. Any of these electrons, these are, like, these are levels. Electron at any level can be excited to a higher energy level. Higher energy level are called each one of these like has a, a anti-bonding orbital. Sigma, uh, pi to star is called sigma star. Okay, Where, what, what are these orbital levels? I mean, if we draw a compound like maybe acetone, as long pair, non-binding electrons, pi electrons, sigma electrons, <laughs> two electrons is sigma. What type of orbital can they be excited to? I mean, have we ever talked about any upper orbitals? I mean, isn't this, a, isn't this a pi bond with orbital orbital overlap? <coughs> What's the excited orbital? Okay, so where we have a difference. Everything we've been doing this course is based on valence bonding. <coughs> Standard valence bonding. These upper uh, excited state orbitals come from molecular orbital theory. Did y'all do any molecular orbital theory in Gentium? You should have. 25 years ago, I did. 
Did you? Okay, that's unfortunate. You would then under, have a baseline understanding of where we get excited state orbitals. Okay? Alright? But you don't see it here. We never talked about when we did hybridization. We ever talked about any excited state orbitals? The answer is no. Okay? Molecular orbital theory discusses this. Okay. So we can we can excite electrons from ground state orbitals to excited state orbitals. And it turns out the energy that, that will do that is the UV vis energy. The energy from IR will not do this. Okay, guess what? Ultraviolet will do this. What about X-ray, which is higher energy? What will X-ray do to electrons? You ever heard of this? What does X-ray do? It causes ionization. Okay? X-ray will actually take one of these electrons and kick it out of the molecule. So much energy. And when you lose an electron, you become a pion. Okay? X-ray will lead to ionization. Ultraviolet will not kick it out of the molecule, but it will raise it to a higher energy level. Then it can fall back down when it, it can re release the energy. Okay? UV vis, up, down, up, down. X-ray, so much energy, I could just kick it out. All right? Make sense? <coughs> All right. Uh, the most important here, I think I put in red and said it's most intense. Usually most important will promote this. Which one is this? Pi to, to what? Pi to pi star. Okay? Usually most intense, and thus most important. Most intense. We'll see this. Uh, which is the easiest transition on here? These arrows indicate amount of energy needed. Okay? <laughs> Go from this energy to way that's a lot of energy. Which is the easiest to do here? Right here? What type of electron are we exciting here? Non-bonding. Non-bonding electrons are easy to excite. They're not bonded, so they're not held together between as, as much. That makes sense? Non-bonding electrons are easy to excite. What's the most difficult to excite on here? Sigma electrons. Why are they most difficult to excite? Because the sigma bond is real strong. It's held tighter. Make sense? These transitions are certainly always ultraviolet. Because ultraviolet is the highest energy versus visible. This one is more likely to be in the visible region when we get out there. Because that's lower energy. And this is a lower energy transition compared to these. Now, very often, these are hardly in the UV range. These require lots of energy. Low wavelength, short, short wavelength, right? Sometimes this requires even shorter wavelength than the typical ultraviolet. Sometimes even less than 200 for this. Lots of energy here, even less than 200. By the way, less than 200 is often called the vacuum UV range. Previous page we said UV was 200 to 400. Below 200, higher energy vacuum UV. <coughs> Typical instrument we scan two. We scan starting at about 200, 200 to the 800. Okay. If you want to scan below 200, you have to do it under vacuum. Why? Because oxygen absorbs below 200. If you got oxygen all around your sample, it's just going to absorb. <coughs> all right? That's why it's called vacuum UV. Not standard. Simple instruments don't scan down there because they're not set up to do under vacuum. <coughs> uh, here's another actual UV viz of this compound here. 
what we see here is sort of two absorbances. <coughs> you see this one, which has been noted as a pi to pi star transition. You see that it's most intense. But it's, it's, it's the most absorption, pi to pi star. All right? It sort of starts here with absorbing. As soon as you start scanning, it's absorbing. <coughs> then the absorbance tails off. But right here, you get this little bump. It's almost like some other phenomenon is going on, and there's another little absorption going on here. <coughs> what do you do this? That one's uh, ascribed to a pi to pi star transition. We do have pi electrons. This one's ascribed to non-bonding pi star. So we do have these non-bonding electrons right here, and that's where they're being excited. Since they're non-bonding, it doesn't take as much energy to excite them. That's why the wavelength is lower for this excitation compared to this excitation. The easier it is to excite, the lower energy your wavelength. Everything's quantized. You'd be like, well, this is high energy. Shouldn't it, shouldn't it excite the, the lone pairs too? No, it's too high energy. You've got to move to a weaker energy. Then you have an exact match to uh, excite those. Weaker energy. Right? And then it tells off 400, then visible. Is there any visible absorbance here? Apparently not, or whoever did this would have showed it. Looks like the absorbance just kind of ends out here, you know, about 350. What's the lambda max here? 240. Does that make sense? Well, right there is the lambda max. What is that? About 240. That's why I said 240. Point of maximum absorbance. Uh, beta carotene. Uh, lambda max is 440. Here, here's the UV disc spectrum. Okay, scanning, not, not much absorbance, something going on here. Whew. Lots of absorbance here. What's the maximum wavelength of the here? What is that, about 440? Okay, you see the maximum absorbance here? Um, I didn't use this terminology before. That's sort of the, the, the maximum absorbance. This over here may be called a local maximum. Well, this is kind of called a global maximum. You know, what's, what's the tallest peak in the world? The tallest mountain. What is it? Mount Everest. Is it? Mount Everest? Where's that located? Okay. What's the tallest peak in the United States? Okay. Well, we call it Mount Everest to be the global maximum of the entire globe, but Mount McKinley or whatever it is, it would be the local maximum, you know, more of a, right? That's your global maximum in this kind of a local maximum. And many local maximum. What's the tallest peak in Peru? Okay, that'd be a local maximum there, right? It's kind of a local maximum. It's kind of a local maximum in this in this area here. Okay, um, could be. I think that's a uh, end of pi star transition. Yes or no? No. Why not? Who thinks that's an end of pi star transition? Everybody saying why not? If you don't have a reason, you're just voting without a reason. Reason? Do no what? There are no lone pairs. Yes, it's simple. There's no lone pairs in this compound, so obviously it's not an end of pi, end of pi star transition, right? Um, yeah. We said pi to pi star is usually the most intense. I'd say that's probably pi to pi star. I don't know. Do you get two different pi to pi stars? Um, hard to say. We're not going to get into that kind of detail. Uh, certainly, it's not any end to pi star. Uh, beta carotene. Why is the lambda max shifted towards longer wavelength? 
previous ones were like 200 and something. Why is this one 440? Has to do with conjugation. Okay? Has to do with conjugation. Have you counted them yet? Beta carotene has how many double bonds conjugated? Okay, conjugation. What does conjugation do to the pi to pi star transition, which is the most intense, which is probably what we're looking at over there. The more conjugation you have, if you go across here, you know, diene, hexatriene, okay? We go from one pi bond, two pi bonds, three pi bonds, four pi bonds conjugated. As the conjugation increases, the energy gap between your homo and lumo decreases. You've all heard of homo and lumo, right? I like the orbital theory and gen chem. You've never heard of homo and lumo? Uh, homo is highest occupied molecular orbital. Homo would be a ground state. It would be your highest occupied molecular orbital at the ground state. Lumo would be your what? Lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, that would be your lowest excited state, okay? And typically when we excite, not always, but most often, and most often for pi to pi star, we go from the lowest occupied and we jump up to the lowest unoccupied. That's the easiest transition. <coughs> the more conjugation you have, the smaller the, the energy gap, and thus the smaller the energy that's needed. And the smaller the energy that's needed, the more you're moving to the right in terms of wavelength, typically to the right. Okay? And that's why we went from 200. Now that we got 11 double bonds conjugated, we move way to the right. Much easier because the gap is smaller. All right? Why is beta carotene orange? By the way, what do you find about carrot? Carrots. Carrots, spinach, etc. Okay. Good amount in carrots, though. Why is it orange? Because it's absorbing visible light. 440. 440 is in the visible. It's absorbing heavily in the visible. And if you absorb visible light, you will be colored. because it's absorbing some color from white light and it's reflecting orange. It's not absorbing orange, it's reflecting orange. That's what you see. But it's taking, it's removing something from white light. What color is it absorbing? Right here, the maximum absorbance is about what color? Where did you be up, right? Is it absorbing more to the red or toward the violet? <laughs> right? We said that's the early. That's more than violet in, right? Blue. I bet a carotene absorbs blue. And if you remove blue light from white light, you get orange. How do we know that? Color wheel. Have you ever seen such? Okay. <coughs> can help you. Yours is black and white. Mine is colored. But I sent it to you by email. Okay, beta carotene absorbs largely where? 440? Right here. Which is blue. But if you absorb blue, if you remove blue from white light, what color will you reflect? The opposite color on the color wheel. Okay? Right here. And what color do you reflect? Orange. See that? What color is the pigment in that blue paint absorbing? <coughs> it's just the opposite. It's absorbing at what wavelength approximately? About 600? The 
pigment in that paint is absorbing at 600. That's why it appears blue. To absorb at 600, how many double bonds do you need to have conjugated? Less than 11 or more than 11? More. Yeah, even more. Now, there's different types of conjugation. In beta carotene, it's all hydrocarbon. It's just alkenes conjugated. You bring in other heteroatoms, lone pairs, and the conjugation can change the lambda max differently. Basically, for the pigment in that blue paint is highly conjugated. Highly conjugated molecules will be colored. Um, go back, go back over here. What color do you think that compound is there? What color do you think that compound is? Is it absorbing in the visible? No. So what color do you think it is? What color? Colorless, like water, or ethanol, or any other solvent you use in the lab. But it's not, to be colored you have to absorb in the visible, and you have to remove something from white light, and then reflect some color. Yeah, how about colorless? It doesn't absorb in the visible. If it did, we would have plotted the absorbance. Uh, here's a type of question you may see regarding this. Rank the following uh, from highest to lowest lambda max. Which would have the highest lambda max? Right. Highest? <coughs> Close to the third one. Very good. Yes, third one. Close conjugate. Three double bonds conjugated. Right? Conjugation narrows the gap between the homo and the limo to a lower energy, and lower energy is more towards longer wavelength. Okay. This would be number one. What be number two? <coughs> This one? Yeah. Two double bonds conjugated. Not as conjugated as number one. What would be number three? Perhaps this one? Why? It has two double bonds as well. <laughs> but they're not conjugated. Correct. Right? There's no P orbital here. We've got two isolated pi systems. Two P orbitals overlapping, two P orbitals overlapping. There's not one system. Which compound each set will have the highest lambda max? You work with both of these compounds. This is transphilbene, you brominated, you made this. Which would you expect to have the highest lambda max? <coughs> transphilbene. Because there, the pi, the, the pi bonds and the benzene <coughs> rings are conjugated all the way through. You've got conjugation all the way through there. P orbitals lined up all the way through there. When we brominated it, the two central carbons are now no longer have P orbitals. The two central carbons are now tetrahedral. No P orbitals. On the right, you have two isolated benzene rings. But over here, you have extended conjugation. The benzene rings are conjugated via the double bond. Are you able to see the conjugation? P orbitals, P orbitals, they're all the way. Like toy soldiers, they're all lined up. Uh, down here, we didn't do the Dills Alder, but if we had, we would have started with this and we would have made this product here. Which would be, which would have the highest lambda max? The question is really what? Which is the most conjugated, right? Okay, which is the most conjugated? This one. One, two, three, four, five, six P orbitals. All conjugated. That's even conjugated too. It's kind of called cross conjugated. Here, two p orbitals, isolated. That's it. Two p orbitals. Okay. You still have this conjugation here, but you have that over here as well. Here you have conjugation. This side, more conjugation. This would you expect higher lambda max. 
Uh, where have we seen UV vis? Well, you've used UV to visualize your TLC plates. TLC plates has a UV a dye or something that absorbs UV. It actually also fluoresces. We'll talk about it at the very end. The fluorescent background helps you see the spots. I'm not going to go into the details here, but you have used UV before. Those lights give you uh, wavelengths, short wavelengths of about 250, long wavelength of about 330. Those, light, those lights also put out a little visible. You can see some light coming out. Okay? It's primarily UV. It does put out a little visible. That's, that's what you see. And you shouldn't be looking too close. But you do see some light coming out of those lamps, right? That's where those bulbs also give you a little bit of visible because they're just hard to, it's hard to give. Only UV. Uh, where else have we seen UV vis? Indicators? Did you do titrations in Jenkins? Yes. I know you did that. <laughs> Maybe about six or eight times. Uh, did you use indicators? Okay, these indicators are different under different pHs. Alright? This one, okay, phenylphthalein. Under acidic conditions, it exists like this. Under basic conditions, it exists like this. Two different forms in equilibrium depending on the pH. Which one is more conjugated? Over here. So actually here, this attacks here and the electrons go this way. Right here, this carbon has no p orbital. Tetrahedron. See here, all rings are conjugated because that carbon has a p orbital which links them all via conjugation. More conjugation. This actually absorbs in the visible. It appears colored. It appears magenta. Now remember magenta? All right. Tip this coming over. You remember that? Side table drawer. Nobody know what I'm talking about? Blue clues. Blue clues. Yeah. Magenta. Remember magenta from blue clues? Okay. This is colorless though. <laughs> As soon as you get the color, then, you're, then you know you're basic. Because it, the, the molecule converts to this, okay? There's chemistry there. All right? Um, steric effects. Um, we're about out of time. Uh, can you be hurt the eyes? I put this in back in the fall when we had that uh, solar eclipse. Okay? Damage to the eyes. Is this one in your hand, y'all? Okay, I thought maybe I took it out. Is this one in your hand, y'all? Fluorescence? Fluorescence? Yes. <coughs> okay, I added it in. I wanted to add this in here. We'll say something about this. Uh, fluorescence, where does it come from? Um, Ultraviolet. The electron is excited. The energy is absorbed. Is, does it stay like that forever? The energy comes back out. It can come back out in a variety of ways. It can come back out as heat. But it can also come back out by releasing light. And one phenomenon that can happen is you absorb UV, but then the molecule releases light of lower energy. Absorb UV, but maybe release visible lower energy light. And that's what's going on when something fluoresces. Okay? If you ever drink tonic water and put a UV light on tonic water, <coughs> it's like water with no UV light. It's blue if you shine a UV light on it. Why? It's absorbing UV, but then it's giving back off blue light. Okay. Now we don't have time to go into all these details, but it's giving off lower energy light. Some of the other energy maybe was released as heat. All right. And maybe you've seen this in uh, marine organisms. This is a some type of jellyfish. The color is supposed to be purple. The, the jellyfish looks purple, and it's kind of glowing. 
It's absorbing UV from the sun, but then it's giving back off a colored light. Okay. So it's a second half step from UV. It's, it comes from the energy coming back out. All right. It's a great application. Quinine was one of the first compounds. Quinine is in tonic water. Remember we did the mechanism in the lab? Okay. You go to the grocery store and buy some tonic water, you'll be drinking quinine. Because very early on, they, they gave it to people to drink as a prophylactic for malaria. They drink this so you won't get malaria. And it's just, just continues. It has a distinctive taste. Very small amount. Still, The FDA has guidelines. You can only have so much quinine in tonic water. But, okay, that's UV biz. Take home message. Conjugation increases lambda max. Can you recognize conjugation? Test on Wednesday, guys. Video, quiz video will be posted today.